Hey, it's good to see you back here. Uh, welcome to Parish Prayers and Beyond. I'm Pastor Craig Beeman, and uh, it's good to see you uh, back with us as we continue. In fact, we are looking, I think, at the last uh, part of the Fruit of the Spirit. I want to thank you for joining us for these because it's been very exciting, uh, and I have thoroughly enjoyed them, and I hope that you have too. If you haven't seen every episode, that's okay. You can go to our website, and over on the right-hand side, there it says something like view, uh, join us by way of video or YouTube or something, uh, and you can click on that link, and it will open up all the past ones. Uh, so you can look at all the past uh, Wednesday evening parish prayers and beyond. And so you can go back and find which one, uh, where we started with the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, so I think you're going to enjoy that. If you haven't heard every episode, I encourage you uh, to listen to these because, as I've said so many times, these are the characteristics of Jesus. And the characteristics of Jesus came with the Holy Spirit when he came to dwell in your heart and mine uh, when we ask Christ to forgive us of our sins and to come inside and to be in charge of our lives. Uh, so when you became a Christian, when you said, look, I want to follow Jesus, I want to be forgiven of my sin, these characteristics came with the Holy Spirit to dwell in your heart and my heart. And so we have these characteristics of Jesus. Uh, and uh, as we walk through the fruit of the Spirit, I've been waiting for us to get to this one. Thankfully, when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our hearts, he brings with us these characteristics that we've been talking about. I almost jumped ahead. I almost jumped ahead on this one and shared it out of order. Now, there's nothing wrong. I don't know that there was a specific order uh, that uh, Paul is thinking about when he writes these Christians in Galatia. Uh, I don't know that this order matters uh, in this list. Uh, sometimes it does for him, sometimes it doesn't, but it is a list of the characteristics of Jesus which the Holy Spirit has brought uh, inside of the heart of every believer. But I wanted to jump ahead. I, I really wanted to jump ahead, but then I thought, well, that would be violating the very topic uh, of this evening, which is self-control. <laughs> so if I jumped ahead and said, oh, wow, let's look at self-control first, well, I wouldn't be modeling self-control. <laughs> so self-control, that's what we look at tonight. It is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. It is a characteristic of Jesus himself. First, what does self-control mean? Now, you might think, well, now, isn't that pretty obvious, Brother Craig? The King James, it's not, it may not be obvious if you're just looking at the King James. If you're just looking at the King James, you see the word temperance. Well, now, back in the day, that word meant self-control. But if you don't know that, if you're just looking at the King James Version, you're saying, well, temperance, well, that means don't drink. <laughs> well, you'd be correct in today's you know, definition of that word. Uh, back in the 1820s, there was an, even a movement called the temperance movement. Uh, and according to Wikipedia, uh, oh, yeah, the most trusted source. But listen, it's it's okay on most things, all right? Most things. Uh, there's a lot. There's some that mm, could be questioned. But in the 1820s, the temperance movement was a, or still is, a social movement promoting temperance or complete abstinence from the consumption of alcoholic beverages. Participants in the movement typically criticize alcohol intoxication or promote teetotalism, which is not drinking at all. That's me. I'm not a drinker. Uh, I don't drink at all. Uh, and its leaders emphasize alcohol's negative effects on people's health, personalities, and families' lives. But that's not what it meant uh, back when the King James was written. Uh, when it was printed back then, the word meant controlling one's self. So words change, and so do their meanings sometimes, uh, you know, so we've got to be careful uh, about what we're looking at and talking about. According to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the written definition is dominion over self or something. Dominion over the self or something. Uh, according to the 
according to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Remember, all of these characteristics that we have been discussing are inside of us by way of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is sanctifying us. Well, now what does that mean? He is making us like Jesus. He is whittling away. He is taking away that uh, which is part of us that doesn't need to be part of us. Uh, those parts in which we have uh, because we are a sinner. And so the Holy Spirit is making us more like Jesus. That's what his job is. Uh, so that's what he's doing. He is sanctifying or cleansing us, making us more like Jesus. This word refers to, this word self-control, refers to controlling oneself in all areas of life. Well, isn't that interesting? All areas of life. All areas of life. So an example of one of those areas uh, that needs to be in control it could be one's temper. Uh, on my report card growing up, the rating on the area of shows self-control was indicated by a check or a minus. Show self-control was switched to conduct at some point. Uh, some point, uh, let me adjust where we're not so crooked. <laughs> we don't want to be crooked. Uh, but it was changed to conduct, and there was a grade given at one point on, in conduct. But back before then, it was called shows self-control. Uh, I happen to have a picture of the actual certified historical document uh, that documented my self-control. Was it a plus or a minus? Let's take a look. Ah, as you can see, I got a minus. I never did really well in that area. I always seemed to have an opinion that needed to be shared, but also I felt needed to be believed by all who heard it. <laughs> Truly, the reason I received a minus in conduct was that I earned it. Uh, I had a temper problem. I could not seem to hold on to my temper. Thankfully, later, as the Holy Spirit guided me, I actually, and I actually listened to him, uh, I did much better. I seem to remember a defining moment in eighth grade uh, where I just decided I needed to learn uh, to listen to God in the area of my temper. I learned to be slow to anger, be glad I did. Do you hear me? I, I'm just letting you know. Be glad I learned. I had a horrible temper. It was, it was terrible. Uh, but it really does help. It does help the old blood pressure when you learn to handle things, uh, when you learn to let God handle things and, and not act out on your anger. It also helps to keep those around you safe from uh, being hurt verbally or even physically. Be angry and sin not, the Bible teaches. We can be angry. I mean, we're going to have feelings, and, and God doesn't say, well, you just can't have that feeling. <laughs> God, is, God understands we're going to have those feelings, but we do not need to act out in anger because people get hurt. People get hurt verbally or even physically when we act out on our anger. Basically, self-control is self-restraint when it comes to one's desires. Obviously, I would point out that self-control is self-restraint when it comes to someone's bad desires, and that's true. But let me also say that this includes one's good desires. What, you ask? <laughs> what? A person can have a fantastic idea, but if it involves other people and they have not heard the idea, uh, had time to process the idea, or contributed to or critiqued the idea in a loving way, then even moving ahead on a good idea may not be the right thing to do at the time. So self-control of even a good idea is sometimes the best way to go. Does that make sense? Uh, 
We must remember to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit when it comes to controlling ourselves, which includes our actions and our words. But it also includes maybe even a good idea we may have. I've watched, I've been a part of people uh, or a group where they've thought, well, that's a good idea, and they move ahead, and they don't stop to think and uh, to consider and critique the idea and decide, well, okay, wait a minute. How can this be interpreted by others? How could this be seen by others? How will others respond? Some people, oh my goodness, I know some people that say, well, God made me this way, and, and this is the way I am. Well, let's think about that statement or that sentiment. Would God expect you to stay unchristlike, or do you think he wants you to be like Christ? God's in the changing business. God's in the rearranging business. God's in the business of making you more like Jesus, so that means you're not going to stay the way you are. You're not going to stay the way you came into this world, because God is working on you. He's still working on you and working on me. And so we must allow him to do his work. The molding of us into the likeness of Christ is what he is doing when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of, you, of your heart. It's what his work is. That's what he's doing. When he comes and takes up permanent residence inside of you, he's making you more like Jesus. That's what he's working on. Billy Graham once said, being a Christian is more than just an instantaneous conversion. Um, it is a daily process whereby you grow to be more and more like Christ. Eugenia Price, uh, author, uh, Eugenia Price once said, if Christ lives in us, controlling our personalities, we will leave glorious marks on the lives we touch, not because of our lovely char characters, but because of his. I like that. Would you like to hear it again? Let me, let me say that again. Uh, if Christ lives in us, controlling our personalities, we will leave glorious marks on the lives we touch, not because of our lovely characters, but because of his. That's what God is doing. God is touching others' lives through us through you, through me, through his children. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can control yourself, your words, your actions. The question is, will you allow God to work through you to do it? Will you allow God to work through you, to help you to control yourself so that others can see him? That's the question I'll leave you with tonight. In just a few moments, there's going to be some prayer requests, some announcements. But let me pray for you in the area of self-control. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you, God, knowing that, yes, I still have issues with self-control. I have learned to give those to you. I have learned to control myself in many cases. But sometimes, Father, even I slip up. Even I decide to let it out. And God, I don't want to hurt people. Help me to continue to be more like your son, Jesus, in the area of self-control. Father, help my friend to do the same. Lord, you have empowered us, enabled us to control ourselves, to control our own words, our own actions. And so, God, help us. Help us to allow you to live through your Holy Spirit, to, 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 to live through us and to help us to control our mouths and our actions toward others. Father, we want to show others your son, Jesus. And we know that if we do not control our mouths, do not control our actions, we paint a different picture of who Jesus is. So God, help us. Help us to control ourselves as the days go by and as we interact with others. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for Parish Prayers and Beyond. Stay tuned. And remember, we'll be right here next week. Same time, same place. Thank you for joining us today.